Despite the glitz, glamour, and victim of misfortunate circumstances reputation that Disney princesses have been known and adored for, more and more people are beginning to see these damsels in distress in their movies are, you know, kind of dark. Stand back, you fools! There's a lot more to a princess than just magic, beauty, and breaking out into a musical number. In fact, based on some of these theories, it would seem that many Disney princesses actually have a really sinister side to them. I am Brad with Wicked Bench, and these are dark theories about Disney princesses that are really messed up. I say we kill the beast. Who killed Ariel's mom? For quite some time, the death of Ariel the mermaid's mom remained a mystery, puzzling most who tried to wrap their heads around what could have possibly happened to her. However, it would seem that Gaming Duelist 15 from Wattpad.com has channeled the skills of an expert detective, as he has come up with a rather convincing explanation, one which brings together two fictitious worlds to find the answer. Human stuff, huh? When you consider the possibility that another popular children's story, Peter Pan, might be occurring in the same universe as The Little Mermaid, things begin to make sense. The catch is that Peter Pan occurs in an earlier time period of the same universe, one in which Queen Athena was still alive and well. We are shown a scene in which the ship which killed Queen Athena is visible. Now, compare the design and look of the ship to Captain Hook's ship from Peter Pan. Look similar? Eh, still not convinced? Well, let's take a look at The Little Mermaid Ariel's beginning. In that film, there's a particular scene in which Ariel is seen desperately trying to escape a pirate ship. The captain of that ship is depicted wearing a rather large feathered hat, much like the same one Captain Hook is seen wearing. Chances are, they are one and the same. Captain Hook is the pirate who took Ariel's mother's life. While the revelation that Peter Pan and the Little Mermaid are in the same universe, knowing that Captain Hook's treacherous activities on the Great Big Sea led to the death of Ariel's mother is incredibly tragic. I swear, Smee, this is propelling me to delirium. Snow White dies and the prince isn't real. Undoubtedly, when it comes to the long list of overly sentimental moments in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, it would make sense not to forget Snow White's kissing scene with the prince. Well, he did kind of make out with an unconscious woman? Hashtag me too. So maybe not super sentimental, but all right, look, the movie was made in a different time, so let's just move on. Now you do so. Regardless, as emotional as that scene might have been, according to a theory shared by Andrea Hickey on BuzzFeed, what we saw may not have actually been the truth. And as much as the scene and its resulting events might seem like a typical happily ever after ending that Disney films are known for, when you take a deeper look at things, you'll find yourself asking, is it really happily ever after? Based on careful analysis of the transgression of scenes in the film, an alternative perspective that does hold quite a bit of weight to it is that, at the end of the movie, Snow White is actually dead. Consequently, the prince isn't actually alive. He's just a metaphor for death. Pretty dark, right? <laughs> In order to understand this, we need to analyze some of the scenes, and more importantly, symbolism and imagery that will make this theory sound more plausible than it may currently sound. As you'll recall in the early stages of the movie, Snow White sends the prince a white dove. White is a symbol of purity and is also the color typically associated with the angels in heaven. The similarity between the dove she sent to the prince and the angels in heaven deepen when you bear in mind that angels, like doves, have wings and can fly. Might not seem like a lot now, but let's take things a step further. Doves are some of the most symbolized species in existence. In some cultures, the white dove is symbolic of the soul being released from its earthly confines. In other schools of thought, it is often regarded as the epitome of inner peace and tranquility. So much so, that in the face of what one might typically be frightened of, the dove accepts it with open arms as a natural course of life. And of course, there is a dove which symbolizes mourning. That said, when you bear in mind those symbolic meanings attached to the dove, the very action of sending forth the dove to the prince does figuratively suggest the releasement of her soul to another, in effect, relinquishing her spirit to the prince and signaling her transition to another realm. But why the prince? What does he have to do with anything? It's because the prince symbolizes death. Think about it. In the beginning scene in which Snow White is singing into the well, she seems downright spooked by the presence of the prince when he appears. Alright, maybe she could just be shy. Or maybe she senses that the prince is really death disguised as a prince who summoned himself as he recognized that her time was drawing to a close. Oh. Hello. Oh. Did I frighten you? 
Considering that this is a kid's movie, it would not be good advertising to showcase Death as the Grim Reaper. For that reason, developers design him as royalty. Therefore, Snow White giving him a white dove is in fact a metaphor for her ceding her spirit to the heavens and accepting the fate that Death has bestowed upon her. So what about the kiss scene? Even though Snow White may seem to be kissed to life by the prince, this is, yet again, another metaphor of her spirit awakening after which she is brought by death to her final resting place, heaven. We know that she's going to heaven because when the two stop on a hilltop, the clouds part and reveal a castle in the sky. Although this theory does have somewhat of a happy ending, it's one of those that drastically changes the way people view this film completely. Belle made up the beast in her head. Many fans of Disney's original Beauty and the Beast have pointed out the similarities between the beast and the film's antagonist, Gaston. These similarities include how prime they are to aggression and violence, their brutish behavior, and their overwhelming selfishness. How can you read this? There's no pictures. Or at least when we look at the behavior of the beast towards the beginning of the story. Go ahead and start! The theory suggests at the beginning when Belle is reading a fairy tale, she brings home the book and indulges in a bit of fantasy. She immediately marries Gaston with her father's best wishes. After all, Maurice compliments Gaston at the start of the story, and the rest of the movie is Belle's fantasy about reforming her selfish, pig-headed husband Gaston, who she views as a beast. What about that Gaston? He's a handsome fella. When you look at some of the evidence, it makes sense. For example, nobody in the village can recall a castle nearby the town, and when Belle runs into all the enchanted characters within, she isn't scared or even very surprised. After all, they are characters she came up with in her head, and many of these characters provide her with what she never had in her life. For example, a mother figure. Thank you. Belle fantasizes that the prince inside will win over the beastly behavior of her husband, but worries that the beast will return and stab them in the back. It's all actually very sad that Belle's life is so incomplete and her husband is so selfish that she can only dream about an alternative reality where she reforms him and falls in love with someone who truly cares about her. Moana became a demigod, but at a cost. There's more to our Polynesian princess star Moana than just her superhuman strength and strong will. According to Reddit user StickUpKid, Moana might actually be a demigod. Who are you meant to be? In order to understand this theory, we need to go back in time a bit to the beginning of the movie, where Moana is selected by the ocean to return the heart of Tafiti to Maui in order to save her people. As part of the selection process, Moana is violently thrown into the middle of a terrible thunderstorm. While details of what happens while she's there are sketchy, when she does wake up on the island, the song which is played is You're Welcome. What could this all mean? Um, what? To tie everything together, let's examine the facts. The song played is heavily associated with powers that demigods have. What's more, she was tossed into a thunderstorm. There's no way that she could have survived unless it was divine intervention. This is where it gets interesting. The ocean, in effect, took Moana's life in order to make her a demigod. Although this by itself isn't very convincing, when you consider how Maui became a demigod himself, it might not be that far-fetched. Maui explained that he too was tossed into the ocean when he was a baby. However, he was subsequently saved by the gods and brought back to life as a demigod. The same thing is essentially what happened to Moana. I could watch that all day. While the cool demigod concept is cool, the way in which Moana became a demigod isn't. She essentially lost her life as a normal girl and was given this overwhelmingly weighty burden to carry on her shoulders. When you consider the fact that her youth was stripped away from her, it puts a rather dark spin on things. The Deal with Elsa's Prison When Frozen came out, we saw Elsa's confusion when she was captured by Prince Hans and found herself in a prison cell, which we later learned was located in the basement of the castle. We shared Elsa's confusion, but for a different reason. What could have possibly been the origins of the cell? Where did it come from? One anonymous user on DisneyTheory.com shared a rather interesting theory on how this cell could have possibly come about, essentially putting the blame on Hans. While there might be several possible origins, the most plausible is that Hans constructed the prison to house Elsa and save himself and the people from impending doom. However, there's a theory that is even darker and, quite frankly, more surprising to believe, yet still valid. What if it was Elsa's own father who constructed the cell to keep her away? We will limit her contact with people and keep her powers hidden from everyone. Now, in order to understand this, we need to recall a couple of facts. 
Firstly, he is very much aware of the type of power that his daughter possesses. Actually, he's the only one who cautions her on how to control her power, and that using gloves will help her. However, Elsa's father is also the king of Arendelle, and as much as he loves his daughter to death, he has a kingdom to defend. The trolls have warned him that there is a power that threatens the very existence of his kingdom. Could it have been his daughter? It's the king! For all we know, Elsa's dad believed that the time may come when Elsa's powers might pose a threat to the kingdom. For that reason, he designed a special cell just for her, in which she could be stowed away if or when her powers become too much to handle. Knowing that her dad may have had to make such a difficult decision is sad to know. What's more, the possibility that her dad may have been plotting the scheme to trap his daughter is a really brutal pill to swallow. Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. What do you think? Do any of these theories make sense? Do you have any dark theories about Disney princesses of your own? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. But most importantly, stay wicked.